Um, I normally work in the, uh, the SI department uh, in the workshops in Finsbury Park. We design and build facilities for um, you know, big, big facilities or little boutique outfits. It's all good. Um, but my other passion is TV colorimetry. Um, being an old BBC engineer from the 80s, um, uh, I used to do an awful lot of colorimetry, uh, calibrating monitors and setting up rooms, things like that, you know, all throughout the 80s and the 90s. Uh, and recent years, we seem to have seen something of a return to that. So we have quite a, a thriving uh, sort of um, uh, colorimetry side to our business. So setting up projection rooms for people, um, advising people on workflows. For some of these sort of more esoteric, um, uh, you know, DCI, P3 color spaces, those kind of things. But even, uh, uh, you know, as facilities get bigger and they need proper color workflow management, uh, you know, through their edit, through their grading, through their deliverable type processes, advising people on those things. So, so it's something we do a lot of. And occasionally, Jerry and Alex get me up to, uh, to Glasgow to, 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 to do um, calibration for customers up here. Uh, but today's session, here we are, TV colorimetry, REC 709 uh, calibration and high dynamic range. Um, so obviously REC 709 is that venerable standard that's been with us uh, since the early 90s uh, and it describes the, uh, the colorimetry of HD television. <laughs> REC 601, the earlier standard, comes from the early 80s and you know, when digital television was really just being thought of. Uh, but we'll start today with a bit of a, bit of a canter through uh, uh, a sort of colour science, a bit of colorimetry 101, just so that we're all kind of thinking about um, uh, kind of those things. Uh, and, and how that translates to film and TV and how, how we model uh, human vision in film and TV. Uh, uh, and, and we'll move on to why we calibrate, why it's important, that, that consistency of colour uh, uh, response through a facility. Uh, and then we'll talk a bit about metamerism, which is a long sort of colour science word, but it's very important because it affects uh, the choice of, of colorimetry probes, how we do the, the mechanics of calibration. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about the current state of broadcast monitors. And I direct you to go and look at the 24-inch Canon uh, 4K monitor that's outside attached to the Media Composer that's showing some 4K material out there. We've got some high dynamic range footage that myself and Dave Skeggs, another one of our colleagues who's here, we shot for BVE this year. And, uh, and when you see uh, high dynamic range stuff, it's staggering how much more sort of uh, uh, latitude there is to the picture compared to regular television cameras. Uh, we'll talk a bit about building LUTs. Uh, and whereas, you know, 10 years ago, we would build LUTs to allow people to um, have broadcast monitors that looked a bit like film stock. Nowadays, we build LUTs mostly to try and tame uh, domestic displays, be they projectors or big uh, LCD or OLED televisions, so that they match the grade one monitor a little bit better. Um, and the future, REC 2020, which is this fantastically large color space that we hope will come in with UHD. Uh, wide color gamut and high dynamic range because those things kind of go together. Uh, <coughs> wide color gamut, high dynamic range, increased resolution, higher frame rates. They're all the kind of promises that come with UHD and, and, and kind of what we've all been sort of jonesing for for so long. So. <laughs> <laughs> There we go, the nature of light. Uh, there's, there's, there's a spectrum of all the sort of wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum that comes from, from the sun, uh, you know, and, and, until, you know, the last few hundred years, all the light that people saw pretty much came from the sun or from things being set on fire. Uh, and and uh, as people, uh, our eyes are sensitive to a very, very tiny little segment of that spectrum. So from about 380 nanometers up to 720 nanometers, typically, uh, we perceive color. Uh, and, and there's nothing particularly different about, about colour light compared to microwaves and, 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 and VHF and UHF radio waves and X-rays, except for our eyes are sensitive to these ranges of colours. So, you know, r right down there we've got ultraviolet and right up there we've got red and, and, and further up into the infrareds. And, and this is very typical for what a person sees, you know, the wavelengths and how we perceive those as colours. Um, some creatures perceive wavelengths further up into the red end of the spectrum, dogs and, and creatures like that. Other creatures, birds and insects, perceive further down into the blue end of the spectrum. But for people, this is typically where we're seeing colour. Uh, so, as I mentioned, most, most of the light we encounter, or, or, or over the, the course of human history, most of the light that people have encountered comes from the sun. And this is, this is the kind of spectrum of sunlight. Again, we've got a similar sort of set of range of values along the bottom here, 300 and something nanometers up to 700 and something nanometers of wavelength. And, and different lines here representing what we see at different times of day, you know, an overcast uh, shadowy sky or a, a bright um, uh, sunlit um, midday or whatever. This is, this is the, the sort of the range of wavelengths and their typical distribution, uh, you know, in the northern hemisphere that we, that we, we, that we might get. Now, uh, 
that was a, that's a very broad bond, broadband response. You know, everything from <coughs> sort, of, sort of blues up to reds and, 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 and um, a rich mix of them. But when you start looking at how people perceive colour, you discover that uh, humans don't see the whole uh, uh, broadband range of colours. We have, we have cones, little tiny light sensitive cells in the back of our eyes, in the retina of our eyes, that are sensitive to three typical sets of wavelengths. And this is a sort of an idealised, normalised uh, diagram of where our responses are. And so round about 600 nanometers, we have what, what we'll refer to as the red cones. They're sensitive to those kind of wavelengths. And then, you know, 500 and something, 530 nanometers, the greens, and, and down there at 450, the blues. And, and by an amazing sort of trick of interpol interpolation, your brain kind of fills in the middle bits. And if the, if the greens and the reds are being sort of tickled kind of equally, you see sort of like an intermediate wavelength. Uh, and, and, and you know, you don't think to yourself, hmm, I'm seeing a very greeny red there. Your brain says, this is a yellow. And, and, and we're very used to that. You know, we're, the illusion of a continuously varying set of colors is, is presented to our, our consciousness. And, and we're not aware that our brain is doing this trick of having to interpolate red, green, and blue wavelengths. Now, it is a very complicated system because you'll look that the, 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 the red uh, response uh, peaks again there underneath the blue response. In fact, because this is a, a sort of an idealized uh, uh, graph, what we don't see here is actually this is a negative lobe uh, and that the red response uh, around about 450 nanometers actually goes negative. And so when you're looking at very, very blue colors, the effect of that is that it also sucks any red content out of the picture as well. And so the eyes don't just work by measuring a wavelength and saying that's the colour we're seeing. They work by this clever synthesis of, 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 a, of a mix of the red, green and blue colours uh, and, and, and by those tri-stimulus values, that's the word we use, tri-stimulus, we, we, we have the illusion of a continuously varying sort of rainbow of colours. Um, this gives rise, rise to something called uh, observer metameristic failure or sometimes metamerism or metameristic failure uh, because as you look along the wavelengths here, you can see that there are several sort of positions where greens and, and reds get very close to each other there and there, similar amounts of closeness and this whole business of the red negative lobes and everything else. So there are wavelengths which are clearly different but you'll perceive as the same and there's nothing you can really do about that and in fact monitor manufacturers rely on this to, uh, to, to be able to present you with a, a complete range of colours on the front of their lovely LCD, OLED, whatever kind of monitor. Um, and, 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 and metamerism is, is kind of a bit of a, uh, a cornerstone of, of, of understanding sort of colorimetry and how that translates into uh, monitors and cameras and things like that. So anyway, there's another effect called color constancy, uh, which Edwin Land, who was the inve inventor of the Polaroid camera, discovered. And, and his, his great um, um, uh, sort of experiment was on a very large white wall in, in the Polaroid factory. He painted a Mondrian, a, a, a mixture of uh, blocks of color. Uh, uh, so big was this, this, this Mondrian that standing in front of it, if you were like a meter standing away from it, uh, it, would, it would encompass your, your entire field of vision and you couldn't see anything else. And then he would light it with different colored lights. And so he'd, he'd, he'd sort of stand somebody in front of it and he'd say, what color is that patch? And they'd say, oh, that's clearly a green patch. I can see a green patch there. So he'd say, close your eyes. And then he'd adjust the color of the lighting. So there was no green light whatsoever in the light that was illuminating the scene. And when the person opened their eyes and he says, what color is that patch? Rather than them saying black, because there's no green light to reflect off it and give you the feeling of green, uh, they'd still see green and they'd still be able to perceive what they previously saw. And it's almost as if you've got a little Rax engineer, a little color guy, you know, sitting in the back of your eyes, kind of grading your vision as you go along. Um, and, and, and you can see this effect. I mean, you can find hundreds of these pictures online. I nicked this off, off Wikipedia. But that pink uh, square there, the pink sort of card, um, you know, stare at it on that picture, then stare at it on that picture, uh, and, and, and they clearly look like different colours. But because of colour constancy, actually, if you measure it by pointing a photometer at it, it's exactly the same colour. And you can find numerous examples of this online. So anyway, that's all, all well and good. Colour science, very sort of, um, uh, you know, clever, and it's, it's well established, 100 years since people have been studying it. Uh, but when we get to sort of TV and how we do things in TV, the, the thing that kind of turns, you know, a black and white TV camera into a colour TV camera is this thing called a dichroic block. It's a fantastic bit of optical engineering that sits inside a TV camera, and as the as the colour light comes in, the dichroic block, it's a set of prisms at the right sort of set of angles, splits the image up into a blue component, a red and a green component. And you get something like this. You get three 
what we, I suppose we would call monochrome images, um, but they represent the red parts of the picture, the green and the blue. And if you look at the, um, the first image there, the red image, look at the colour of, uh, of the young woman's blouse. Uh, it was sort of very brightly coloured there because it was a red blouse. Look at the green and the blue components, not so much. There's almost no green or blue in her, in, in the shirt that she's wearing. Similarly, look at the green foliage behind her head. And in the green image, it's very pronounced, <coughs> not so much in the blue or the red. And, and so this fantastic bit of optical engineering, the dichroic block, is able to split up our, our, our multicoloured world into three component colours, three component images, which we can then start doing work with. And what, as you well know, we barely ever deal with RGB data in television. If you've got an SDI cable, the likelihood of RGB data going down it, which it could be, is rare. Most of the time we're dealing with YUV, well, that's what very lazy engineers call it, YCRC, CBCR is, the, is, is a, a better designation. And, and so just looking at that first um, uh, scale there, you know, good old colour bars, you know, it's, it's not hard to say what are we looking at here. We've got something that's very bright there and very dark there, and as we run our eyes along the colour bars there, we can see it's the same number of bars, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and that's, that's clearly corresponding to that one, and that's clearly corresponding to that one. So, so this first bit of, of what we deal with in modern production workflows, the, the, the luminance signal, is somehow related to the overall black and whiteness of the picture, and that's exactly what it is. It's, it's a luminance signal, it's the black and white signal, and, and it's, 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 it's what we kind of keep uh, at maximum resolution when we're moving signals around facilities, down SDI cables, when we're encoding things onto an AVID, when we're playing things out, putting them on a transmission server or whatever. And then we've got these two other uh, signals. Uh, and again, it's a bit harder to, to tell what these are. Um, looking at this one, you know, clearly like this is something very, very negative going, and maybe that's that. And this is something very, very, very positive going, and maybe that's that. And so with a bit of kind of imagination, you can see that this, this signal here relates to the blue signal, but it's not entirely the blue signal. It's the blue colour difference signal. It's how, it's how different our picture is at any specific point away from blue. So yellow is very unblue, and blue is very, very blue. And similarly, for the third signal, the, the, the red colour difference signal, the CR, or the V signal, if, if you're a very lazy engineer, is, is related to red. When it's at its maximum, we've got a red colour. When it's at its minimum, we've got a, a cyan colour. And, and so cyan being very, very unread and red being very, very red, that's what we deal with. So you might think to yourself, well, why on earth? You know, we've got a camera that's capturing RGB. Why on earth do we turn that into something different? Three signals that aren't RGB, you know? And, and if we look at the, 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 the equations that, that govern that inside the camera, you know, Mr. Sonny, when he designs a new camera, he has to go and look these up uh, so that what comes out the BNC on the back of a, his camera is correct. Uh, and, and so here's the old 601, you know, from the early 80s. And here's Rec 709 that we deal with now. Uh, clearly, yeah, the luminance signal, as we call it Y, is built by, by mixing the red, the green and the blue in some proportion. And then the two colour difference signals are made by taking away that, that luminance signal away from uh, the colour component we're interested in and scaling it and adding something to it and whatever. And in fact, you could spend all day going between YCBCR and RGB. You know, you've got the mathematical recipe here, the, the equations. You could go between R RGB and YCBCR all day, converting backwards and forwards. No quality would be lost. No changes would be made. And so it, it begs the question, why on earth would we do that? Why do we bother to, 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 to use a different um, uh, set of numbers for moving pixels around our facility on and off our AVIDs or whatever, um, rather than the RGB by which they were acquired? Well, the trick is that um, if we go back to our, um, no, go forward to our, I've actually lost a slide. <laughs> Excuse me a moment. There we go, Microsoft Word will save us. <laughs> yeah, look, I, I knew I'd lost a slide. <laughs> so here we go, here's our, here's our, um, Here's our, here's our colorimetry model. Um, and uh, we said earlier that, that, that blue was very anti-yellow and, 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 and cyan was very anti-red. And so you, you can kind of see that, um, whereas that, that previous slide where we, where, where we could see uh, you know, the response of the, of, of the little uh, cone cells in the back of our eye, how they relate to wavelength, um, in 1931, or in the 1920s, I should say, a lot of research was done into um, colorimetry 
and how we perceive colour. And, and this is, the, this is the, uh, the diagram they came up with. And so rather than having uh, three values, R, G, B, uh, it's been translated into a two-dimensional shape. And you can still see the wavelengths around the edge of this. I mean, it looks like a guitar plectrum, doesn't it? It's sort of like this curvy shape here uh, with, with you know, all the way from, from those very deep blues round, round to reds with all the intermediate wavelengths. And so essentially we've mapped a 3D set of values onto a 2D space, a 2D surface. And, and we refer to this as a gamut, the gamut of human vision. And there you can see in, inside there, that triangle, that's Rec 709, that's the limits of television colorimetry. Well, you see you think to yourself, well, that's pretty poor, isn't it? Look at all those greens that we can't represent on television and all those reds that we can't see on, on, on e even a nice HD telly. That's the case, you know, television is a very poor uh, carrier of color. And then right there in the center, we've got D65, which is our white point. By universal agreement, that's where our white point is. And it's that kind of, that proportional mix of red, green, and blue right in the center there. And, and so this is, this is the model, you know, in one image, this is the model of color that we use for pretty much everything nowadays. Print, television, film, any, anything where people are worried about color consistency. People who manufacture paint know about this, this model of human color vision. Um, and, and as I say, it's referred to as the gamut of human vision. And that triangle inside there is referred to as the gamut of, of Rec. 709 HD television. Now, a couple of fun facts about, about colorimetry, if there could be. Um, uh, Russian speakers uh, from birth, um, uh, when, when, when um, tested uh, by adulthood, Russian speakers can perceive more shades of blue than the rest of us. It's like... What a bizarre thing, but, but it's been proved in several studies that Russian speakers can see more shades of blue than the rest of us. And it's because the Russian language has more words for blue. You, think, you know, you're on the Baltic and the azure of the, the water and the... I can't think of any other words for blue in English, but the Russians have got loads of words for blue. Uh, and as a consequence, they grow up trained from birth in how to perceive shades of blue, which, we, you know, which you know, other European speakers can't. Um, there's another uh, little fun fact. You, 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 might, you might know that about 10%, 5% of, of men are red, green, color blind. So they've got none of this discrim discrimination here. They can see blues and they can see kind of muddy browns and that's what the world looks like to them. And some of my best friends are red, green, color blind. They live perfectly honest lives and you know, you shouldn't be hard on them or anything. But, <laughs> but, but red, green, color blindness is a, is a thing. Uh, but it turns out that women who have red, green, color blind sons often can perceive more shades of yellow than the rest of us. And they can do that because they have a, a fourth set of, uh, of, of light sensitive cells in the back of their eyes. They're, they're tetrachromats, they have, they're, 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 they're not tri-stimulus people, they're quad-stimulus people. And they can see real uh, yellows, whereas the rest of us rely on our brain to do the interpolation between green and red. And so if you're ever in the position where you're hiring a colorist, you know, maybe you've launched a brand new facility and you want, you want the hero color, colorist who's going to grade the next big BBC production. Look for that Russian woman who had a colorblind son. <laughs> <laughs> There's no better colorist than her, you know. <laughs> so color is one thing and uh, the, 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 the mechanism by which we perceive color is those red, green, and blue cones in the back of our eyes. There's also some other light-sensitive cells in the back of our eye. In fact, they're a lot more numerous. They're called the rods. And, and there's about 100 times more rods than there are cones. And, and that's what gives you broadband detail to your vision. Um, I was doing a similar presentation at, uh, at, um, at um, BT last week. And one of the engineers said, oh, it's like luminance. And it's exactly like that. You know, you've kind of got luminance sensors in the back of your eyes and you've got color sensors in the back of your eyes. The luminance sensors are a lot more sensitive and there are a lot more of them. So think about when you wake up in the middle of the light, night and you, and, you, and you look at the, the red dressing gown that's across the bottom of your bed. You don't see a red dressing gown, do you? You see a gray dressing gown. And it's only really when there's a decent amount of light in your room that you see the red dressing gown. Um, it, you know, you're a lot, lot more sensitive um, uh, both in resolution and in sensitivity to, to, to the black and white images. And so that brings us to this idea of gamma. Um, and, and, and so how do we deal with uh, the, the response between the very dark parts of a picture and the very bright parts of a picture? Well, if we spin back to the 1930s, when people were first developing electronic television, so television that didn't, rev you know, didn't rely on rotating wheels and, and, and bright lights and things like that, but actual electronic television that used cathode ray tubes, um, 
they realise that the response of a, of a cathode ray tube is not a linear response. Uh, if you put in a small amount of current, you get a small amount of light out. If you put in a larger amount of electric current, it doesn't relate in a linear fashion. It has a, it has a, a gamma response. And so at the time, because there was, wasn't a concept of everybody's television having digital processing inside it, at the time, the broadcaster said, or well, the BBC said, uh, we should define a gamma that's the inverse of what televisions will have, and that's what we'll apply at the camera end, so that when our pictures get through to the domestic uh, viewer at home, they see a consistent linear response between the very dark parts of the picture and the very bright parts of the picture. And so for you know, 50, 60 years, we got used to the fact that the standard definition television had a 2.2 gamma. So, so that, that was the, that's, the, that's the shape of the gamma curve. When we got to uh, Rec 709, um, uh, the EBU and, and SMPT really goofed up because they didn't really define what the new gamma for television should be. And so a lot of people pressed on with 2.2 as the gamma. We like 2.2, it kind of works all right, looks, pictures look all right. A lot of people said, actually, the definition for the camera is nearer to 2.4. We should kind of use 2.4 or, or 2.35, you find in lots of monitors. Um, actually, the, the truth of the matter is a lot different. Uh, it's, it's defined in, in, in Rec 1885, 1886, can't remember. Uh, and, and it basically uh, uh, defines a much more complicated gamma than we're used to. And it's really only in the last uh, few years we've started to get equipment that actually complies to it. So here's, here's that 1886 specification there. It's quite a complicated um, uh, waveform that's described. Um, and you know, the best you can really do is in, in, in bright environments, so maybe in an edit suite where the curtains are open most of the time and the lights are on, 2.2 is a good compromise. In a kind of a dark grading room where, where the lights are controlled and, and nobody's kind of opening the curtains and stuff, 2.4 is perhaps more appropriate. But 1886 is, is more complicated than that, and it's only really, as I say, the last few years, a couple of years really, that monitors have started to have it. So if you go and look at our Canon monitor we're showing outside, one of the choices for gamma on that is, is 1886. And, and, and so if you're working in a Rec. 709 environment where it's important that things are right, um, uh, go for 1886 rather than any of the compromised values of 2.2, 2.35, 2.4. 2 Charles Poynton, who's uh, kind of forgotten more about colorimetry than most of us ever knew, uh, he kind of makes that observation that if you've got a controlled environment, 2.4 will do, but it's not perfect. And, um, you know, kind of, you know, we kind of like perfect really, wouldn't we? Anyway, moving on. Um, a lot of what we do is setting up people's uh, grading rooms, their, their, their viewing theatres and things like that, so that they've got accurate colorimetry. And uh, you remember that word I mentioned earlier, metamerism, um, or metameristic failure. The probes that we use to measure the light coming off a monitor, uh, they typically will be set up to mimic the metameristic failure of the display technology they're working towards. So this is, our, this is our, my workshop, and you can see there's my Tektronix, and, and you know, I've got a little signal generator there, and I'm feeding a white field into two monitors. One of those is a Sony OLED monitor, and the other one is a, a JVC LCD monitor. And they've both been calibrated correctly so that the, uh, that the pictures showing on the front are, are, are close. You know, it's a good match. Um, one of these probes is an LCD probe, and the other one is a general purpose probe that can, can, that can handle different um, uh, display types. And you can't see it there, but on, on my next page, um, I can show you uh, an enlarged view. You can see that on, uh, on my general purpose probe, um, I've got uh, colour values uh, that are uh, those um, XY measurements there with that luminance <coughs> measurement there. But on my, my DK technology LCD probe, which is now pointing at the OLED monitor, we're getting entirely different colour readings. And so this tells us that, um, uh, you know, that £200 uh, x right probe you bought on Tottenham Court Road or, or whatever the, uh, the technology uh, uh, shopping street here in Glasgow is, uh, which they told you was great for CRTs, LCDs, OLEDs and plasmas, there's, n there's no such a thing. Um, you, you know, this is, the, this is the, the spectral response of a CRT, and you can see that kind of blue and green look kind of good, don't they? That, that's, 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 that's kind of consistent, and, and if we think back to the, the diagram we saw earlier, you know, looks pretty much the same. But look at the red response there. That is, that is the sort of the final word in, in red phosphor in a CRT monitor. That's, this is a Sony uh, BVM D24, if any, anybody remembers that model. And so clearly, this is a million miles away from what we'd want for uh, matching to human vision. 
uh, the metameristic failure of the CRT, of the phosphors in the CRT, is clearly quite bad. But, you know, this is a 100-year-old technology, and Mr. Sonny and all the others have had a long time to develop what they call a matrix, which is just a little waiting circuit. You know, in, in the analog days, it's a bunch of transistors and resistors. Nowadays, it's done, it's done digitally. Uh, but they had a long time to develop a matrixing function so that they would, they would uh, boost and attenuate these values such that it would give a pretty good approximation. The metameristic failure of the monitor would be, in a way, matched by the matrixing function to the metameristic character of your eye. And for many, many years, we just assumed that if you wanted to accurately calibrate a CRT, you'd have a CRT probe, a CRT probe that matched the metameristic character, the spectral uh, distribution of, of the monitor you were going to point it at. If you're going to do LCDs, that was another model. If you're going to do plasmas, that was another model. And it got to the point about three or four years ago where I'd go, I'd, I used to dread my six monthly visit to Channel 5 to do all their monitors because I'd be carrying like three Peli cases with probes in. Uh, now, there are probes that, that do a better job than that. They're called spectral radiometers and they, they do a broadband measurement, but they're kind of quite complicated gadgets. They've got rotating mirrors and prisms and, and, and CCDs that have to be cooled to a certain temperature before they'll work reliably. And they cost more than 20,000 pounds. It's not the kind of thing you let the clumsy engineer carry in his rucksack to the client's premises. Um, so all these devices are, are, are what, are, what are known as photometers. They, they, they measure RGB, a bit like your eye, but a bit like your eye, they have metameristic failure as well. And so you have to use the right one for the right technology. Until about a year and a half ago, when Klein launched a, a probe called the K10A, where they said, hang on, what's the point of trying to match the metameristic failure of our probe to any specific display device, to an OLED, to a plasma, to an LCD? Why don't we match the metameristic character of the probe to the human eye as close as we can so that it gives you the same kind of results you get when calibrating a monitor by eye? You talk to any good studio engineer and they're very, very used to flicking around the cameras, camera one, camera two, camera three, and making small adjustments on their, on their control panel so that those cameras match, so that when the director calls for camera two, people's faces don't change colour. You know, that people are very good at using their eyes to match things colour-wise. So Klein's response was, well, why don't we make a probe that mimics that? And so this is now the way forward. You, you, you build a probe that has uh, a very similar spectral response to the human eye, and, and that's kind of good enough for, for, for all kinds of di display calibration purposes. So there's a few myths and gotchas. Um, the, the whole business of, ca of generating... Um, Test signal to monitor calibration isn't hard. Really, you just want, you want some greys and some peak whites and some pluge so you can get the black set correctly and things like that. Um, you see a lot of nonsense online about, about, about how hard it is to generate the necessary signals to get a monitor calibrated. But remember, our, our luminance signal is a mix of red, green and blue. And so long as we get white response correct, we are getting the mix of red, green and blue correct. So, so you know, we have no control over the primaries of a monitor where, where deep saturated red sits where deep saturated green and blue sit, but we do have control of the color balance of the monitor. And so doing it on a, on a white field, on a gray field, on a 10% gray field is, is exactly what you want to do. As mentioned, those cheap USB photometers that uh, you, know, you buy, which are really aimed at the print prep industry, the Hueys and the things like that, uh, they're not appropriate for, for, for television and film work. Um, computer monitors. So many times I, I, I go into people's edit suites and they moan that their Final Cut Pro or their Avid monitor, the playback window doesn't look the same as the broadcast monitor and the client wants to know why you can't have that colour rather than that colour. Um, and, uh, you know, there's no way you'll ever get a, uh, a, a, a computer monitor to match broadcast uh, standards. Um, we, uh, we have one customer who, um, uh, we, there's a brand of monitor we sell called Boland, a big American manufacturer, and they are fantastically good value and, and very, very capable monitors. Uh, I was demoing one at Christmas and I'd, I, hadn't, um, I hadn't calibrated this monitor for a little while. It had been around several customers for, 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 for demo. Uh, and so the next customer we wanted to see it, I said, it's been out for like a month. I haven't seen it for ages. Can I come over and I'll just chew the fat with you and drink coffee and calibrate the monitor while I'm telling you about it? And so that's what I did. And when I finished calibrating the monitor, the colorist was sitting there, and the colorist said, right, can we compare it to my Dolby, my, my, my PR4200 series Dolby? I said, yep, no problem. So I looped the signal through the Dolby into the, into the Boland, and uh, he put up the, the latest grade he was working on, and the two were entirely different. You know, the Dolby was far too saturated, it was sat up, it was, it was just too blue in the whites, it was wrong. And he said, well, it's rubbish, doesn't match my Dolby. And I said, well, 
your Dolby doesn't match Rec 709. You know, come on, you just saw me calibrate that thing. Um, and he wouldn't have it. And eventually, the engineer confessed to me that the colorist had spent an age matching his Dolby to an iPad because most of the customers they have do review and approval on iPads, and that was all they cared about. So this kind of brings us, we mentioned LUTs earlier, this brings us back to LUTs because, because quite often it's useful to use a LUT to make one kind of display technology look like another one. But the thing about LUTs, and I hear people banging on about how LUTs are fantastic and, and all colour problems are solved by LUTs. Remember, a LUT can only diminish the dynamic, dis, dynamic range of a display. It can't increase it. It's, it's, it's pulling in the number of colours that can be displayed, not expanding them. So one of, the, one of the things we use lots for a lot nowadays is to tame domestic displays. Um, uh, back in the 90s, uh, when you built grading rooms, you would intentionally put a composite uh, um, domestic television at the back of the room so that it was a grot monitor, so that if anything was going... It, I mean, the pictures could look fantastic on the grade one at the front of the suite, but maybe you're doing something that's not going to translate well into domestic deliverables. And so we'd put a, 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 a typical you know, domestic set at the back of the, of the suite so that at least somebody had eyes on what it was going to look like when it was transmitted. Nowadays, that seems to have gone out the window and everybody wants a big 55-inch plasma or an OLED at the back of the room that perfectly matches, you know, the monitor at the front of the room. And I often think, well, you know, you spent £18,000 on that monitor. What makes you think that £1,000 telly at the back can match it? And if it can, why did you spend eighteen grand on that monitor? Why didn't you buy two of those? But, but you know. Um, and, and, and so... Having said that, modern televisions are fantastically wide gamut and, and fantastically you know, capable. And for the most part, you can get them to match really just by eye calibration alone. But for that last kind of 1%, that last you know, cyan in the mid grays thing that the colorist has spotted, uh, a LUT is really your only answer. And so a lot of, a lot of uh, kind of what we do is, is building LUTs uh, to match um, two monitors. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to fire up Lightspace, which is my favourite um, um, colour calibration software. Oh, there's a new version. Do you dare me to, to upgrade? <laughs> yeah, you, you've clearly been at too many, too many trade show demos. <laughs> So I'm going I'm to pull in a, um, uh, uh, a, 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 um, a profile I took of a, uh, this is a Sony OLED, uh, Sony OLED television. And, and look, there's our, you know, we're familiar with that already. There's our, our, our CIE 1931 chromaticity chart. And uh, I think I only ran this as a, a 10 point LUT. We'd normally do a 17 point LUT for, 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 for um, you know, matching displays, but time was of the essence. So I think I only ran a, a 10 point LUT. But you can see that, look, the primaries, they match pretty blinking well, don't they? And, and the white point is, is bang on. And, and, and the two triangles sit on top of each other perfectly. So the, the gamut of this, of this Sony domestic 800 pound OLED television uh, matches our Rec 709 profile almost perfectly, and if I um, if I close that and I say, well, okay, that's uh, you know that, uh, we're, we're feeling pretty good about that, but you know, colorists are fussy people, and we want it to be exactly as perfect as possible. So what we're going to do is we're going to build a LUT um, uh, with Rec 709 as our target <laughs> color space, and with that um, profile as our source, and uh, we'll, we're going to turn that into a LUT. And so if I hit create the, create the LUT, Lightspace tells me that the color space conversion reports 100% within target range. So this, this you know, 800 pound television is entirely capable of, dis of displaying all the Rec. 709 colors. So that's kind of good, isn't it? So let's, let's take a look and see what that, um, see what that, what that LUT looks like as a, as, a, as a cube. And so what we're seeing here is a, uh, those, those colored dots are the Rec. 709 color space. And the, the cube that surrounds them is the, the limits of the monitor's uh, uh, colorimetry itself. And so you can see there's quite a lot of gaps uh, yeah, between Rec. 709 and the limits of what the monitor can do, particularly in the green end of the spectrum. It seems this monitor can go much further out into greens than Rec. 709 requires of it. And, you know, similarly down there in the yellows. I mean, clearly, there's processing goes on in domestic television, you know, true pixel TM you know, and all those other kind of funky uh, modes that tellies have uh, where, you know, things aren't perfectly linear. But, you know, pretty much this LUT 
uh, to make this OLED look exactly like Rec. 709 is not going to have to do a lot of work. And we can take this data now and export it and, and copy it onto a memory stick and then and copy it into one of those 400 pound AGA LUT boxes or a Blackmagic box of some sort. And that television now is tamed. That television is now is a Rec. 709 uh, monitor. And, and, you know, as a display device is as, as faithful, if not more so, than, than um, you know, broadcast monitors of only five years ago. So, you know, we, we live in a world where um, uh, things are a lot better than they ever used to be. So let's uh, crack on. So there we go. That's, that's our, uh, we've seen that already. There's our, there's our, our Rec. 709 uh, uh, equations again. That's how the luminance is made. And remember, it's a mix of red, green, and blue. And that's how the two color different signals are made. And they you know, just, just kind of weighted and, 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 and um, you know, luminance removed versions of, of the, the blue and the red um, uh, channels. But what you will notice is that the luminance channel, uh, which is, if, if you remember, is our black and white, it's our grayscale um, uh, data, um, is entirely dependent on red, green, and blue tracking well with each other. Uh, you, want, you want this to be true of pixels that are very near to black, just like 5%, 10% grey, and you want this to be true of very bright white pixels, things that are very near to maximum whiteness. You, you want your grayscale to track correctly from an RGB point of view. So this is, this is a, um, uh, the, um, the profile of a well-known um, uh, broadcast display. I say broadcast in quotes. Um, because although I could, I could get this monitor to be quite close to uh, a black and white neutral in the low end of, of, of its range, right down near black. And in fact, I chopped it off, but, but actually the, 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 the colors kind of come together at peak white. But all the intermediate values, so the black line is, is, is an idealized grayscale response if everything was good, but the red, green, and blue lines are the actual response as read back from the front of the monitor. And this is a monitor that's sold and I see in huge numbers in TV facilities. Uh, and presumably some people grade off it as well. But the grayscale between the very darks and very bright parts of the picture is very poorly represented. There's a lot of RGB crosstalk. So that one will remain unnamed, <coughs> Sonny. <coughs> um, uh, this is, this is the model that, that we, 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 we'd prefer you to buy, made by Boland. This is a, this is the, this is a, actually, this is our own demo, BVB25, that lives its life in a flight case, traveling between facilities. And there's the idealized gray response and the red, green, and blue response sat on top of it. And you think, well, that's as close to perfect as perfect can be, you know? How on earth has Mr. Boland achieved in his OLED monitor what that other gentleman couldn't achieve in his monitor. Well, I mean, there's no secret, it's, it's, you know, and in fact, Mr. Flanders does the same trick. Uh, as their monitors come off the production line, they point a probe at it and they, and they, and, and they, they profile the monitor and, and they load a LUT into it so that they've tamed their monitor to be Rec. 709 compliant. Uh, because all display types have failings. An OLED's failing is it has poor RGB linearity. The RGB, those tiny, tiny little semiconducting elements, which are so close to each other that you get kind of quantum effects, electrons leaking between the little, uh, the little LEDs. Uh, and that gives rise to poor RGB linearity within the display. Um, we never had to deal with that with CRTs. CRTs were very, very linear, so long as you didn't overcrank a CRT so that it was you know, kind of you know, bent out of shape at the top end. CRTs were remarkably linear in their RGB response. LCDs pretty much so as well. Uh, LCDs suffer other things, CRTs suffer other things, but the thing that OLEDs suffer from is poor RGB linearity. And so if you're in the business of buying a, 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 an OLED monitor for broadcast, you really should be looking at one that comes with a, a profiled LUT in the machine already. I mean, nowadays, it's very cheap to buy a decent quality LUT and, and bolt that on the back of your monitor, but it's kind of nice that manufacturers have taken the trouble to do that. And as I say, the Boland BVB25 is one that does that. Flanders CM250, another fine monitor, that does it as well. And, uh, and, and you wind up with a monitor that is kind of tamed from the factory. Now, interestingly, um, the, uh, the, the, that, that, that there is, it, oh, no, I won't make a secret about it. It's a Sony PVM A250, uh, but, but it's the PVM range, the professional video monitor. With Sony, if you want, if you want that, RGB linearity in, in the monitor, you have to go to the BVM range, which is a £12,000 monitor. It's not a £4,000 monitor, it's a £12,000 monitor. And that's their distinction. You want the broadcast video monitor, you get good RGB linearity. If you buy the professional video monitor, you, you, know, you get that. 
Um, and so that's, I don't know why they do it. They're, perhaps they think that they'll, they'll cannibalize their, their BVM range uh, uh, if they sell PVMs that are kind of good enough. But uh, yeah, that's the, that's the kind of way of things at the moment. So that brings us to the future. Um, Rec 2020 is the uh, is the standard we're all aiming for, you know, for 4K and 8, 8K ultra high definition television. And I'm not one of those people who kind of gets very fussed about 3840 and 4096 pixels. The DCI film snobs get very sort of uptight if people if you describe 3840 pixel 4K as 4K. It's not 4K. It's UHD. But you know, pretty much any piece of equipment that handles UHD also handles 4K, so we, we won't worry about it. But one of the other things that comes to the party with, with 4K and, and 8K as well, because yeah, that's just around the corner, <laughs> is, um, is a much wider colour gamut, and, and it's this one we see here. If you remember, the, the, the Rec. 709 colour gamut was a modest little triangle in the middle there, but Rec. 2020 is a much, much bigger uh, specification. It kind of gets almost to the end of the greens and much deeper into the reds and, and, and the blues. And, there isn't yet a monitor that can do this. Um, a lot of uh, manufacturers, you know, Sony and Canon particularly, will say, yes, our 4K monitors can do 85% of, of Rec 2020, which to me seems like a pointless observation. I know when I'm in a grading room and I've built a LUT for the plasma at the back, if Lightspace tells me you've only hit 99% of the color space, I know the colorist is going to see it in an instant. You know, 99% of any color space is not the whole color space and colorists will see it immediately. And so to say something's got 85% of Rec 2020, for me, just seems like an admission that it's not Rec 2020. So there's no current monitor that you can buy that can do Rec 2020. Some of them can do the P3 color space, which is kind of midway between Rec 709 and Rec 2020, and it's used for digital cinema deliverables. Uh, but, you know, these are the primaries for uh, Rec 2020, the, 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 the definitions on the, on the graph of where red, green, and blue live and where the white point is. Um, uh, and there are a couple of different models of projector that can do Rec 2020 today. And presumably by, by the year 2020, you know, everything will do Rec 2020. And it's fantastic that, that you know, we've got a much bigger gamut that we're aiming towards. And the other thing uh, that um, uh, comes along with Rec 2020 is a new Luma transfer function. And you'll notice that this Luma is Y uh, with a, what, like a semicolon, uh, uh, like a quote mark. So, so why dash? And, and, the, and the reason why we do that is because um, we're, we're, we're after an effect called constant luminance. So currently, um, uh, the gamma effect is applied at RGB. Then the RGB signals are mixed together uh, to give a luminance signal. And the luminance signal, because it's a, a result of mixing gamma-corrected RGB signals, is also gamma-corrected. But actually, uh, because no camera has Perfect, perfectly matched gamma for R, G, and B, you get some color crosstalk leakage into the luminance channel. And so again, Charles Poynton, uh, you know, very, very significant character in the, in the sort of color world, he's argued for a long, long time that we should have constant luminance, as it's called, that we shouldn't apply the, the gamma correction to R, G, and B. It should be applied to luminance after it's been derived from R, G, and B. And so that's why you see why, um, what, what do you call that, like half a quotation mark? Apostrophe, why apostrophe? Yeah, that's why you see that. It indicates constant luminance. Considered a much better thing you know, for colour and fidelity. So, all those exciting things um, a wider colour gamut, a um, uh, 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 higher frames per second, higher resolution, uh, and a high dynamic range. These are the things that, 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 that um, uh, are coming with, with, with ultra high definition. And high dynamic range, what does that mean? Well, that's the, that's the ability of a camera to capture um, much more detail in the blacks and much more detail in the whites. And you think, well, how on earth do you do that if, if, if you're using SDI and it's 10 bit and all those things? Surely, you know, that's already defined. So what the different camera manufacturers do, Sony and Canon typically, is that rather than having just the Rec. 709 gamma, they have a much more elaborate gamma where they can concentrate a lot more of the bit range in the black parts of the picture and a lot more of the bit range in the bright parts of the picture. And the kind of the mid parts of the picture, the mid greys, the mid colours, um, have less dynamic range than they would traditionally. And so you wind up with these alternate gamma responses. So there's, there's Rec. 709 there, the green one, and you can see that kind of tops out you know, maybe two stops above, uh, you know, those very low neg, neg 10. You know, so so if, if, that's, if, that's, 
if that's 10 bits of, of, of dynamic range there, 10 stops, if you will, that's kind of where, where X709 lives. But by altering the gamma response of their cameras, uh, both Canon and Sony are able to get much more dynamic range. And it's typically all about the specular highlights. It's about being able to represent much brighter parts of the picture um, uh, for, for, for the post-production process. And so typically, if you're shooting for HDR at the moment, you're probably shooting on an F55 or an F65 if you have a Sony workflow, or maybe a Canon uh, C300 Mark II if you're shooting um, you know, with a Canon sort of like process in mind. Um, there are some deliver delivery systems as well. BBC and NHK have a, have a, a part-baked um, uh, delivery spec, um, uh, you know, which still has some work to do. Dolby Vision, or sometimes referred to as Dolby PQ, have a delivery spec. And, and they talk about sort of massively bright peak whites of 4,000 candelas per meter squared. Remember, our broadcast monitors at the moment are calibrated so that our peak white is at 100 candelas per meter squared. Dolby talk about 4,000 candelas per meter squared. Now, the, the, the Canon monitor out there uh, that you might want to go and have a look at, that peaks out at 600 candelas per meter squared peak white. So only six times brighter than broadcast white. Uh, the Sony gets all the way up to um, 1,000 candelas per meter squared. But nobody yet has built a monitor that can hit 4,000 candelas per meter squared. Presumably they give you sunglasses with it, you know, or something, you know, <laughs> suntan lotion maybe. Or um, but the hope is, and this is all kind of wrapped up in ST2084, which again is an evolving standard, it's not, you know, it's not baked yet, is, is how we deal with specular highlights. That, that's what makes high dynamic range pictures look special, the specular highlights. So if you've ever seen any of the demo footage from Sony or anybody else, Avid or Canon, um, they tend to shoot this stuff, you know, near rivers where you get lots of sort of like specular highlights in the water and sort of like at twilight. I'm convinced that in a few years time, every television program you watch will be, you know, near a bay, near a dock, you know, in, in you know, early evening, because that's when, that's where H, uh, high dynamic range pictures really shine. Um, but the principle is uh, that the, the last bit um, of the SDI stream essentially represents all the values above mid gray. And, and so we calibrate the monitor so that mid gray is at 100 candelas per meter squared. So rather than 100% at 100 candelas, we calibrate so that 50% is at 100 candelas. And that last bit, that last half of the dynamic range is devoted entirely to specular highlights. And the monitor that might be able to handle 1,000 candelas or 500 candelas per meter squared, basically you just kind of hope that it maintains its color linearity for the specular highlights. Um, so HDR is a bit of a crapshoot at the moment, but you can do it if you've got a half decently defined workflow. And this is footage you'll be able to see on the Avid outside on the Canon monitor. So this is, this is some stuff we shot for BVE. And I literally just put the camera on the floor pointing down Tottenham Court Road in the dark. And yeah, it doesn't come out great on a projector because this, is, this isn't a blinking high dynamic range projector, is it? But anyway, it's not a high dynamic range PDF either. But you can see that if you look at it, go and look at it on the Canon um, uh, out there, you can see in the headlights of the taxi, you can see detail inside the headlights. You can almost see Lucas Industries kind of like, you know, embossed in the glass inside the headlight. And then if you turn your eyes up to the same, same frame, um, if you turn your eyes up to the, the sort of the night sky, you can see lots of rich detail in the, in the trees and, and, and such. And so um, shooting HDR may not produce pictures that you, you'd use directly, but they are fantastic for the colorist. The colorist now has oodles more um, latitude to do things that he wants to do with them. So obviously on the Avid, in the Avid playback window, um, uh, it, it will render it uh, in, the, in the playback monitor on the computer monitor as if it was Rec. 709. There's nothing you can do about that because maybe it's having to sit alongside other things. But at least Avid gives us a, uh, a LUT tool for each clip where we can assign a look LUT um, if we need to see it differently on the monitor. So if we need to see it as Rec. 709 on the monitor. And so this is the little trick we do. We set Avid to apply a Rec. 709 LUT to the pictures. We put the Canon monitor into Rec. 709 mode, i.e. we take it out of HDR mode, and that shows us what the pictures would look like off a regular television camera, off an EX3 or something else that you just sat on the floor at, pointed at Top Court Road. And there is no detail whatsoever in the, in the, in the headlights of the taxi, and there's no detail whatsoever in, in the night sky. And it's quite a, con a compelling demonstration of, of why shooting HDR gives your colorist just so many more options um, for what they want, might, might want to do later on. So, that's me. Um, I've kind of overspent my time a little bit, haven't I? <laughs> but um, here's a few resources you might like to dig into. Um, 
Michael Toon's book, uh, Color Reproduction in Electronic Imaging, is fantastic. And if you only own one book about colorimetry, make it this one, because it's brilliant. It's not, it's not a cheap book, it's 60 quid, but it's, it should be on every engineer's workshop shelf, for sure. Um, there's a few video podcasts we've done um, uh, about this stuff, about calibrating monitors, about managing color workflow through facilities. Uh, and you can find those either at the Route 6 uh, website or um, we'll put, these, we'll put these, um, this PDF online later, won't we, on route6.com. Um, uh, you know, ISO have a fantastically free sort of color management book, uh, ebook that you can download. And Belle Nuit Montage, um, a Swiss facility, they've got some great resources for colorimetry on their website as well. So uh, having kind of taken up far too much time, if you want to ask any questions, uh, we could do, or if you want to go and look at the fantastic Canon monitor out there, you could do that as well.